Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. I, I'm still reliant on that old language from the before time of welcoming people for coming out, but thanks for sitting at your computer and logging in. I'm Miriam Good. I'm the director of the Mind Science Foundation, and we're joined tonight for our talk about addiction uh, by Judy Grizel, PhD from Bucknell University. She is an internationally recognized behavioral neuroscientist and a professor of psychology at Bucknell University with an expertise in pharmacology and genetics. And her research focuses on determining the root causes of addiction, of drug addiction. And a current focus of her lab is to understand the role of gender differences in different trajectories of alcohol abuse in men and women. She also recently published Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction, a New York Times bestseller and Goodreads Choice uh, 2019 finalist and many other accolades. It's a wonderful memoir and science related book. I, I've listened to the audiobook three times now. It's a beautiful read. I, I highly encourage you to purchase it. Um, and in addition to her academic publications, she has published work in the popular press, was an invited presenter at the Gordon Research Conference, and has been featured on NPR's Fresh Air. So before we jump in, so welcome, Dr. Grissel. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Yes. And We're before virtually here. Yeah. Yes. And before we jump in, I just wanted, for those of you who are new to Mind Science, just wanted to let you know we're located in San Antonio, Texas. And Mind Science is a private operating foundation with a mission to fund early career researchers conducting innovative brain research that will lead to improvements in the health and well being of humankind. And we do this through our Brainstorm Neuroscience Pitch Competition, which you can learn about on our website, www.mindscience.org. And we're also committed to funding valuable educational programs like this to help you realize the richer, fuller, more meaningful life that we all want. Um, so as we get started, if you want to say hello in the chat, um, please feel free to do that. And if you have questions as we go through tonight, go ahead and uh, put them in the Q&A section and when we reach uh, the end of our presentation, we will go to those. Um, just a reminder, a link to the download of the, this talk will be sent to you in the, in the next two or three days. So welcome, Dr. Grissel. Um, she's Thank been you. with us. Yeah. She was with us this past May. And, uh, you know, honestly, if ever there was a speaker that I would have loved to be with in person, it really is you, <laughs> Judy, because nice. um, really and truly the, the impact of your book, the humanity of your, your book, but also the clear, uh, the clear communication of the science of the model of addiction uh, was something that I hadn't run across before. I've, I've read a lot. I'm sure we've all read about addiction, but you were able to explain it in a way that, you know, the light bulb in my head went off. Um, and so we really need that kind of translation of science. It's so needed. Um, gratifying to hear. Uh, I, I, I thought I would never be the type of person to write a book. I was one of those who wrote scientific papers that no one read, you know, except my mother who had to, but, or, you know, a few other scientists. But um, I do feel like there, uh, there was so much data and so little understanding that, uh, you know, it was like a challenge and it took me a while, but I'm really happy to hear that you felt like it helped explain things for oh. you. That's the goal. Completely. Um, so to get started, would you please explain the basic neuroscience of addiction? <laughs> sure. That's in, a, you know, in five minutes, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, in, in a few minutes, I would love to. You know, first thing I want to say, I guess, about it is that the experts 
still argue about what exactly addiction is. Now they're calling it substance use disorders, um, but uh, we change the, the criteria all the time. Every time the uh, psychological disorders manual comes out, it has different categories and different types. We talk about being drug dependent or drug abuser. Um, I think that I, um, I care a lot about what the definition is because I am a recovering addict. And my first definition, I still think is one of the best. Um, and it's the one that I came up with in treatment because I was just trying to understand what is wrong with me and why am I uh, so un, you know, why am I self-destructing? And that's all I really want to do is self-destruct even though I didn't. And so I would say in a nutshell, um, the, the definition I've used is that the cost of our using outweighs the benefits. Certainly uh, um, recreational drugs have benefits. They help us relax or cope with stress or um, enjoy things more. But uh, at some point there's kind of a tip so that you're paying more than you're getting. And that, uh, that paying more than you're getting is due to the fact that the brain is adapting. So this is the model that you're asking about. And it, it turns out that the brain for its uh, own agenda, which is basically to keep us alive and thriving, does not like to be high. <laughs> uh, it doesn't like to be too high or in fact too low. And so it has a, a, a capacity that uh, enables it to um, reverse or counteract any extreme emotion. And this, we don't probably notice so much, but for instance, if, um, if we all have a kind of a baseline feeling of neutral and in yours and mine might be different, but I'm just used to myself. So I feel okay, you know, if nothing much is going on, that means I just feel like my normal self. And this enables me to notice uh, and pay attention when something really good happens or something really bad happens. And if I was, uh, and I have been someone who likes to feel high more than I like to feel neutral, I take drugs over and over again to sort of keep trying to inflate that. The brain, um, because it's necessary for it to be able to notice when something important happens that's either good or bad, uh, it, it adapts and counteracts that. So for instance, um, what drug withdrawal is a consequence of this and withdrawal happens in regular users to any drug. And it is always the exact opposite state that the drug itself produces. So if the drug helps you concentrate and be alert and attentive, then withdrawal is where you're uh, kind of spaced out and lethargic and uh, not able to track things. If the drug makes you uh, relax and um, sleep well, then withdrawal is tension and insomnia. If the drug makes you uh, reduce your suffering and your pain, then withdrawal is pain and suffering. So it's always the precise opposite because um, it's a reflection of what the brain has done to sort of compensate and bring you back to that neutral state. And in regular users of any drug, the drug works less and less well, which is tolerance. Um, and tolerance occurs because the brain is trying to um, undermine or counteract the effects of the drug. And so these, uh, these uh, sort of hallmarks of addiction, uh, withdrawal when you take the drug away and tolerance with regular use are both due to the brain adapting in order to maintain a static or homeostatic internal state, just like your body temperature, I guess everybody can relate to that. So if you get too hot, you sweat to be cool. If you get too cold, you shiver to generate heat. And the brain does the same kind of thing with feeling states. If you get too happy, it brings it down. If you get too low, it, it actually brings it up. And um, you know, you probably experience, everybody experiences these things without drugs. So, um, you know, having some scary news or some bad news or maybe a near accident or a near, you know, bad biopsy or something, 
Uh, but then having that go away so that the danger is gone, we, we feel relieved and not just for a second, but you know, sort of in proportion to how long the uh, worry or anxiety was. Or, you know, in the days when we used to go on vacations, uh, this is a good example of the other way. So vacation is kind of an inflated time, but when you come back home, you don't, you feel less than. So um, just, I guess the main, here, here's another way of saying addiction that I like this definition a lot now. Uh, so addictio comes from the Latin word um, uh, to uh, owe or to enslave. And it turns out that if you were someone who owed somebody money in uh, ancient Rome, you were given to them as a slave. If you could not pay the money back, you were then their property and they could keep you until you paid the money back or you died. And there was no kind of, you know, tit for tat, it was either the money or you can, I'm doing what I want with you. And I think addiction is like that. It is, um, it's what occurs when the debt um, we've accrued from borrowing good feelings from the future comes due. Oh, that's powerful. Oh, good. Wow, that is so powerful of a, a word picture, kind of slave, you know, owing something, a debt that you can't pay or that's very powerful. And I, I've also heard you use the phrase, there's no free lunch. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So even, uh, you know, this is probably something we could relate to, even a glass or two of wine has a little rebound to it. And it might not be a hangover if it's just that, but you might not sleep as well. Or you might just be a little uh, not quite feeling right after that. So whenever we um, provide a chemical to our brain to produce one extreme, you know, to change our feeling state, the brain produces the opposite. And um, for that reason, there is no free lunch. You have to pay for the lunch and you pay for it later. And the more you try to inflate it, I mean, the, the thing that's different about drugs is that we can deliver them when we want and basically as much as we want. There's so many high potency things around. You know, you can buy alcohol and gallon jugs, you know, there's almost no limit. So yeah. we, we keep trying to get up and up and up, but the brain is, um, you know, nothing if not a master at adapting. And so it has no problem counteracting all of those effects which means that when the drug is around, you feel kind of normal. You know, this is, this is okay. When the drug is not around, you feel much less than normal. And the interesting thing about addicts and uh, alcoholics is they're not really enjoying their using. They're just avoiding the terrible feeling of not using. You know, think of a cigarette smoker. The first cigarette of the day is pretty good. Um, but the rest of the time, you're just trying to stave off the terrible feeling of needing a cigarette. And this kind of leads me into a question that, uh, that I've talked with a lot of my friends and colleagues and peers about, you know, we get together on Zoom and, and the topic seems to be, gosh, I'm drinking way more than I did before, you know, guilty here. Um, so what I'm curious about is okay given homeostasis and the set points that the, our brain is trying to keep us at so we're eight months in and we're all done with this you know everybody's done with the covids but we know that we have another you know whatever eight to, to 12 months left <clears throat> excuse me and so my question is for those of us who've increased our habit of drinking to deal with this stress, will that behavior go away or lessen once we're, we emerge from the pandemic? Or is that something we really need to be thinking about um, our behaviors right now and kind of being aware that, you know, habits don't take long to form. So what do you think about that? Well, I definitely think that there are going to be more people who have disordered use. Uh, you know, there are already, I mean, the rates of 
disordered use, addiction and alcoholism have been increasing for a while. So they tend to go up and up and up despite all our research, despite all we've learned, they're still increasing. They seem to be increasing at a faster pace now, reflecting the fact that more people are using. And what um, you're kind of getting at is what determines whether or not you end up with a problem in a way. And that is, uh, a kind of a complex interaction of a genetic liability, some people are more prone than others, um, with uh, um, age of use. So for younger people, they'd be more likely to develop a problem than uh, people in their 30s or 40s or 50s or older. Um, but anybody who uses enough will develop a dependence that is not feel right without the drug and uh, tolerant and then craving it. So I think you you will have to pay it back. Uh, now, if we if we go on and on like this another eight months, um, you know, sometimes the drink that so you know I have a lot of friends who are normal drinkers, the social drinkers, and they you know they would maybe drink twice a week before COVID, and then they started drinking maybe every night having a drink and now every night two drinks. And this reflects the brain's uh, adaptation. So I think that when the um, habit turns into a compulsion, that's a big red flag. When uh, also when you skip a night, which you know I would invite everybody to try and uh, really see how well you sleep, see how well you, um, you know, get along with your family at the dinner table, see how irritable and discontent you are. And if you feel uh, just as good as normal, then you're probably not heading there too quick. But if you, if you do feel a little, uh, like the night is a little more stressful or less pleasant, then, um, you know, that indicates that the brain has adapted and that you would probably need to, uh, dial it back. And I think, um, you know, anybody can develop a problem if they, if they use enough. I know that the sales are very high and it's, we're stuck at home and uh, isolation is an issue. So it's, it's kind of, um, you know, my concern is more for the people who are like me, who are kind of you know, or who might be like me, who are kind of on the line. But I think all of us should ask another question to figure out if we have a problem. And that is, uh, you know, whether or not our use is enhancing our life or, um, or diminishing it. And it's a really fine line. It's sometimes hard to see. And if it's a habit, then my argument would be it might not be enhancing as much as you would hope. So can you talk about that space between habit and compulsion? And mm. um, so like for, you know, most of us are fairly self-aware and we can say, oh, hey, I'm in this habit. I'm, I'm questioning myself in this habit. Mm -hmm. But is it that when you tip over into compulsion that you lose self-awareness or is that a physical uh, no, act yeah, at that point. That's a good, very astute uh, observation. So it is sort of that way. It's not maybe quite as black and white, but um, you know, initially people usually pick up for uh, for often it's young people for experimentation or fun, you know, just to see what's new. In a situation like we're talking about, people pick up, they didn't used to drink on Tuesday nights, but now, you know, they're spending so much time on Zoom and it makes it a little more interesting. So uh, they're, they're sort of choosing to do that. That's cortically driven. You know, we have freedom. We, if something happened, we would not do it. You know, if, if a better option came along or you're playing a game with your grandchild or something, maybe you'd say not now. But then uh, the more you do it, the more it becomes a kind of a coping mechanism. And we haven't used that word yet, but I would say coping and habit uh, arise kind of together. So usually, you know, uh, maybe it, it's coping with the stress of the day. And if it's just one or two drinks, it, you know, it's not going to totally 
be terrible, but it's, it's less and less enjoyable over time. But what happens with a compulsion is that it shifts largely from cortically uh, choice driven behavior, which you may or may not be able to inhibit, you know, to more or less degree to a kind of um, deep brain structures uh, kind of, it's sort of like the way you drive home if you, if you meant to stop and get the milk, but you go the same way every time, you know, it's kind of like that before you know it, you've mixed the Manhattan or you've uh, lit the joint or something. And it's not, you know, there's sort of no one home while that's happening that, uh, you know, I think that is harder to break. Um, because the purpose of those kinds of com things, some things like this, is is to take uh, choice offline, so you can do other things with your cortex. So then you have to really apply. It. And you you had an interesting comment earlier, Miriam, that you would um, you know do something else if you could. So you know when you're trying to back off, it'd be good to go bike riding or on a trip or something. And this is an issue. And I live in central Pennsylvania, and so now it gets dark at about 4 15 you know and i think no movies no uh i don't know what else we used to do but it seems like more than eight months but um yeah i think so for people who've so we're i'd like to move into the topic of for people who are are past like this habit and they're into the compulsion they're into full-blown addiction um, what is life like for them right now in terms of like, like we know there's more stress, there's more isolation, um, but how has this impacted an addict's access to treatment? Mm -hmm. So we can't, you know, obviously we can't, um, we can't go places with the freedom that we used to. We're doing all of our medical visits pretty much. Um, virtually, does that impact on the importance of an of somebody struggling with addiction to get treatment in person? Well, the treatment centers are very motivated to help to make sure that it doesn't, because this is not you know going and getting a, a you know a ingrown toenail or something. I mean, this could be life and death. So many people who get to the point of being willing to go to an inpatient treatment center need help soon. And I think that the treatment centers are trying to do a good job in, um, you know, having some quarantine and, uh, you know, it's very, the hard part I think is that there's an increase in the demand and um, there's just not enough beds and there's not enough uh, workers, you know, counselors and therapists so you're lucky, I think, if you can get in a treatment center or if you were in one before and you could still stay in. I think it's, um, but, but once you're kind of associated with the place, I think there is a big attempt to try to keep you connected. And there's, even though we're all sick to death of the online stuff, the online stuff has saved a lot of um, alcoholics and addicts who were otherwise very much connected to a community of people that were supportive. So I think there's a lot of that. I think the real uh, scale things are um, people who haven't gotten to treatment yet and haven't even been able to maybe come to terms with that and are using more and more. You know, there's definitely an increase in overdoses. Um, there's an increase in uh, alcohol, you know, the people are staying home and drinking. There's, I guess, an increase in all mental health disorders that go with addiction. So um, I, I have a feeling that, you know, for years and years, we'll be dealing with the rippling effects of this time. And are, are you expecting, and this is kind of a, a rhetorical question, because I think I know the answer, that with younger people who are kind of coming of age during this time of great stress, and maybe don't have uh, you know, they're not out at football games or well, I'm in Texas, I think they are, but, <laughs> but um, so are you, do you look down the road and see an increase in young adults who were teenagers right now who might not have 
traveled that path to addiction, but might now? Yeah, you know, I I don't know. So I'm I'm eager to see the data, especially if it's not as bad as we as we fear. I think one um, I think there are going to be some silver linings in some ways. So this is building resilience in some kids. Yeah. Like you know, oh. they have. I'm I'm a college teacher, and I've just finished teaching uh, general psychology. Almost finished, um, and I have a lot of freshmen in there. And they are brave, you know, and they, and some of them have not come to campus. They're doing this from their, you know, living rooms and stuff. And I just admire how, um, how I, they're trying to show up for it. I think they recognize that this is, um, you know, new ground. We're all bushwhacking here and they, you know, they've picked up their, their books and their tools and we have online, you know, meetings to get to know each other. So I feel like, um, and also it's harder to meet with a dealer. It might be harder to fewer parties. So I was thinking on Bucknell's campus, normally this time of year, there's quite a lot of alcohol flowing and we, it's not that it's dry by any means, but many fewer parties. And some of the older students were telling me that they think there really is less drinking uh, because they're not getting together in such big ways. But I have a unique, uh, you know, my own children and the people in my town are only just a small slice. So I imagine if you're somebody who's got um, few resources and access to drugs, this or, or alcohol, or weed, this is a time where you would be self-medicating. So that's the danger. On one hand, there's definitely an increased drive to take away this uh, you know, frustration and tired some, you know, just the whole thing. Um, so I think there's more incentive to use, but in, in it also may be harder. And there may be, uh, I've heard from kids uh, who picked up new, skills, you know, learn guitar, something. So maybe it'll be interesting, I think, to see. Um, yeah. So, well, that's unexpectedly encouraging. I mean, we, we do need to be looking for the silver linings in the midst of this. Um, one thing I wanted to, to get your thoughts on was at the same time, you know, there's this is always been the issues with addiction. There's also a lot of research going on now about um, psychedelics and, of course, weeds being uh, decriminalized and legalized across the country. So how do you kind of square those two things in your, you know, in from your perspective that, uh, and I'm not talking like, Anyway, I mean, we could talk a lot about that, but do you have like a, like a thoughts on that? Like the, like the same time we're talking about this rise in addiction, but there's also this great interest in, um, of course, weed and in like psilocybin. Um, can you just comment on that? Sure. Um, there's a lot. I also just want to mention there, I get there's some questions in the chat box and I think Miriam said put them in the Q&A because it's a, I can't really read them. So I'll try later, but or, or I'll, we can talk about it. But um, there's always been interest in the psychedelics. So it's not that the interest is new. It's that the um, ability for scientists to do the research is new. Okay. So those uh, psychedelic drugs, which I don't include marijuana in there, it's right. things like psilocybin or LSD or mescaline or DMT, ayahuasca, um, peyote. Anyway, those things uh, are uh, being used in uh, clinical trials for uh, anxiety, depression, lots right. of kind of things. And I think that's wonderful. I don't think those drugs are addictive. Um, which is kind of hard to say because they have such a bad rap, but they don't have the same kind of neurobiological signature that all other addictive drugs, including marijuana and ecstasy or MDMA do have. So I put them in a different category. I'm very excited about the research, partly because we don't have great uh, 
um, ways of helping people who have a lot of uh, mental uh, disorders and uh, you know affective problems like depression and anxiety. So this this is you know somewhat interesting, and there is some little bit of good data, and I try to talk about that in the book. I think that um, marijuana is being put into this category of being medicinal, which is hilarious to me because I think it's no more medicinal than wine is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's used as medicine, but it's not doing anything good medically. And so I have concerns about that. I, 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 I have them, I feel a little bit like one of those ex-smokers or something, because I really loved marijuana. I smoked a lot of it, but I do think that the consequences are not going to be good, especially for developing brains and people. Um, the, uh, um, we see that, for instance, there's more psychosis in people who smoke more, for sure. A big um, increase in likelihood of being diagnosed with schizophrenia, which is still rare, but still it's completely debilitating. There's cognitive impairment um, and the more high potency weed you smoke, the more likely you are to be impaired. And there's also a recent study showing depression. So uh, the more you smoke, the more depressed you are, kind of like with alcohol, the more you drink, the more depressed right. you are. So it's used to treat depression. And I, I will, uh, we don't have seen the data yet, but I'm predicting that it will also be a rise in anxiety because the brain adapts. So if you're using to um, reduce anxiety, uh, the brain will adapt by producing anxiety. So then you need to smoke to feel normal. And when I quit smoking, I was really anxious for months, you know, had a very hard time sleeping. Nothing was, uh, you know, kind of on edge. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's very widespread. <laughs> Maybe not all good. Um, super, um, well, not super that it's widespread. <laughs> But I like that you make you draw the distinction between the psychedelics and weed and other addictive substances. I don't think a lot of people realize that that there is a difference. Um, so I want to. It's six thirty, and we have a, we have lots of questions. So I would like to jump over to Q and A, and we're just going to open it up uh, with a question from Teresa. Given your comment about marijuana and its medicinal use, do you agree with the use of CBD? You know, um, CBD is interesting. It's, it's not addictive at all. In fact, it might be part of the plant's ability to counteract THC. So THC is entirely uh, the reason that people use marijuana recreationally. And the more CBD is in there, the less the THC works. So it kind of counteracts it innately. So the breeders, of course, realize this and they breed um, to sell to get high with less and less CBD. Um, so if it doesn't get you high, it, it could just be over the counter. It could be a placebo. You know, placebos work for almost everything in most people. So it might be that we think they're doing all this great stuff only because we could become addicted to sugar pills easily um, and find them, you know, relieving our neck pain and uh, our stuffy nose and our dog's bad mood or whatever. So I think some of this probably is a placebo effect. However, there are um, now three types of childhood epilepsy that are very serious terrible disorders where the children um, you know, are causing brain damage by having so much seizures yeah. and the only thing they can do is surgery and CBD uh, works for that. So that's what we know so far. I'm all for more studies. And I also think in the meantime, put it over the counter. You know, it should be cheap and you know, everybody can try it. And whether it's uh, you know, doing anything real or not in all these other things, we'll find out. I think the studies will show, but we don't have the data yet. I, I Yeah, go back to the science is what I always like to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question uh, from Marga. Uh, please address addiction in a broad way, including the connection to overeating and obesity, 
uh, you know, regarding food addiction, the use of food for other than what is needed for nourishment? Mm -hmm. Wow, such a good question. Um, the, the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, Nora Volkow, uh -huh. believes that food addiction is absolutely like a drug addiction. The, the hard part, I think, for people who have food addiction is that with drugs, you can be abstinent, but you can't not eat. And so where is the line? You know, I don't have one glass of wine because it would be hard, you know, it would be a big glass and the glass would get bigger every day. So I would know if I, I just don't drink wine or scotch. But if, if it's food, I think it's sometimes harder to tell. I guess um, when I can tell is when uh, the I'm drinking or using a substance or a process like eating or even solitaire or something to cope. If I'm, then I'm not usually doing it to nourish myself. You know, I'm doing it to escape. As a, if it's a tool to escape, then um, I think it is like every other kind of addiction and it's equally harmful. I mean, sugar is poisonous as methamphetamine is poisonous in some, you know, general ways, they're very similar, and uh, killing lots of people, um, certainly not for nourishment. So I think the same kind of rules apply. And one, one thing that I think the substance, uh, drug substance users have as an advantage is that they can kind of go cold turkey. And I think that's harder to do with food. But the, the same thing, you know, getting support and, um, uh, you know, finding things like I notice for myself, since I don't use drugs anymore, I, I sometimes when I have a tough day, I'll just crave some, I call it white food, you know, it could be sugar, it could be potato chips, could be um, corn chips, you know, something nice and white. And, and when I eat those things, I feel better for a very short time, and then I don't, and I'm hungrier. So I, for myself, feel better when I don't have any of that. And it's, you know, not so fun the first few days, just like it wasn't so fun giving up other things. Um, I have a question from Peggy. Uh, what do studies show about addiction in children who were born to mothers who used heroin their entire pregnancies, resulting in severe withdrawal in the infant? Uh, do these babies have higher risk factors than just the potential genetic predisposition? So fantastic question. Not as much as you would think. So the, the, it looks terrible when those kids are withdrawing. Opiate withdrawal is really uh, torturous. It's not life-threatening. And this is a little bit of a complicated um, question maybe, but, uh, or answer maybe, but opiates mimic the um, natural peptides that we have, like endorphins and encephalins. And so they're not as damaging to the brain and to the brain development. A mother addicted to methamphetamine, even though the baby doesn't look as bad when it's born, probably has more long-term damage. And there was recently a study. So I, I think that, and also we've gotten much better at knowing what to treat them with. So it is a tragedy. It's a terrible thing. But we're, uh, the, the most effective treatment is actually the antagonist, not methadone, but because um, methadone is, does the same thing as heroin does, just not quite as well or fast. Um, but instead the Narcan and little tiny doses of Narcan in new babies um, really help them get over it more quickly. And, and there's, doesn't seem to be, so alcohol for instance, prenatally is, is worse for the baby's outcome than uh, heroin. Now there was a recent study like two weeks ago in um, JAMA. So in the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at mothers who smoked weed, which is a very common thing. In 2019, the um, 
CDC, I think, came out and said, you know, whoa, here, we don't know if this is bad or not, but we think you shouldn't do it. But the rates are really going up, and I don't mean to harp on marijuana, but really uh, very compelling data showing they looked at um, offspring long term. So there was either people who hadn't smoked or who smoked until they found out they were pregnant and quit or who smoked in, through their pregnancy to maybe help deal with it, which many people do. Um, and there were more attention problems, more uh, behavioral problems, both uh, like acting out and depression and anxiety, more, um, there were several things, but basically there was a, in every case, a significant um, deficit in those kids. And they were looking at them when they were five and six years old. So it was a longitudinal, really well done study. And it does not look like it's safe early on either. And you would think, you know, oh, it's just a weed, it's just a plant. But so, you know, is our poppy seeds. And yeah. as you say, this isn't good either. So really, um, yeah, and I guess the last thing I would just say about that is if everybody around you is using so regularly and so thoroughly and you're a pregnant person who's dealing with a lot of things and you also have to deal with being socially uh, separated that way, I think it's hard. So we might need to support people more because it's not safe for the kids. Tragic. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about effective ways to help someone who has a serious long-term addiction. Often family members are tempted to detach because of the pain of staying in touch. Mm, oh my gosh, yes, I so can. Um, I so can. I think I have um, a few pieces of advice. One of them is to be really honest. So we detach and as we, because it's, it's, and my family tried to do the same thing, you know, it's just, you don't want to look at it. It's awful to watch and um, it's painful to watch. But I think that if uh, instead you can just be honest about yourself. So it really hurts me to see you because um, I love you and uh, we used to have so much fun together, but now, you know, we don't do these things anymore because you forget to show up or um, I'm, I really, you know, just talk about myself. I'm worried that you're going to die. I'm worried that you're going to get sick. I'm worried that you're not going to come home. I, you know, me, if I talk about myself and just tell the person what's going on for you, because I think that detaching actually helps enable the addiction and addiction thrives in isolation and it, it and recovery needs connection and it's you know it's asking a lot i understand because um it's so hard to watch it is really so hard to watch but so saying what's going on and then um offering help if someone wants it but I think other than that, take good care of yourself, you know, buy yourself flowers. Don't, you know, don't try to, uh, you know, enable or don't sacrifice your own well-being for someone else who's uh, struggling because that never works. Um, tell the truth and, and see if you can, you know, offer a hand if they're, they're ever willing. And I say, to people very straightforwardly, if you are willing to change, if you want to change, I will help. But if you don't want to change, like one thing you don't have to do is you don't have to listen on the phone. You know, I just say to people, oh, I can tell you're drinking, that's just fine, but I have other things I want to do tonight. You know, I don't really have time for this because um, that, that sounds like I'm detaching too much, but if they're using, you know, actively, so you're, yourself. so you're talking about setting healthy boundaries and, and for yeah. yourself. Yeah, I think it's important because, um, well, because it's a long haul for most people, you know, it's, it's really, it's a long, um, tough thing. So I think it's important to, to have self-care, but also to, as much as possible, 
talk about myself and, and how it affects me. You know, if you're the child, you know, I, I was hoping you would be a part of your grandchildren's lives, but I see, you know, but I'm sad that you can't be because I can't really trust you because I'm scared that you'll drop the baby or, you know, something like that. I think telling that kind of truth is, is necessary. Um, so Julia asks, uh, kind of, you, you've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but she'd like to hear your views on terms like enabling and codependency uh, with her view that these are old school terms that haven't caught up to the latest neuroscience. Hmm. So, so, so yeah. go ahead. No, to me, like, um, and, and I'm, I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't have a PhD or in neuroscience or in psychology, but I kind of group the psychological aspect from like the neuroscience, the physical things that are happening in the brain. Um, so I put like enabling and codependency under the psychology column. Yeah, although I, I take the point um, that everything psychological is also biological. So we don't have a psychological state, meaning a feeling or a thought or a behavior that isn't underlied by some you know, neural process. So it's completely, you know, there's a map there. We don't know it all and I don't know it. So the, um, so I would be speculating only. My, my area is pharmacology and genetics. And what I wanted to do, it, we said the root causes, but I wanted to figure out what was different about the brains of people like me uh, before we ever started. I just wanted to know what makes my brain so liable when you know my husband can sort of take it or leave it. But I think that codependency and enabling the neuroscience of that is the question. And I, I honestly don't know the neuroscience of that. Now, maybe, uh, maybe this person does, and I'd be really curious to talk later maybe, or, um, uh, but I can see how for sure codependency is an addictive process. So that the person who's rescuing gets a lot out of it. It doesn't seem to me as much fun as cocaine, for instance, but for these people who are really into it, you know, this is the center of their lives. And I guess in a way, what it shares with cocaine is just the escape. So I can escape from responsibility for my own state if I have, uh, you know, either a chemical or some food or some gambling or um, gaming or somebody else to worry about. The enabling neuroscience, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a fine line between caring and enabling. And for me, it comes down to uh, caring doesn't hurt me, <laughs> but enabling does hurt me because um, I'm sacrificing myself for the other person and they don't, it's like pouring from an empty pitcher wise words. Um, so we have another question. I know that this is not neuroscience related, but I am curious. Do you think that decriminal, decriminalization of drug use and legalization of drugs will have more positive effects than negative? It is unfortunate that stigma prevents a lot of people getting help. You kind of touched on this before. Yeah, no, I haven't so much said on about the... Um the legalization. And I, I like the way the person put it. So I do think, first of all, there's, you know, the horse is out of the barn, there's really no way to pull it back. And I agree with not pulling it back based on the fact that two of the most damaging, dangerous drugs have been legal for so long, alcohol and nicotine. So it's completely hypocritical to say, oh, but not this one and not that one. So, I, but I like the, um, you know, I do think that the more I worry about kids and we don't, we won't be able to stop them from using and they, they won't be able to stop themselves from using. So maybe we need to work on that together. And I, I do think that's a separate issue, but I, but let's just say for consenting adults, I think if there's more awareness and understanding about how the brain adapts and so more education in all kinds of ways, um, and also 
a recognition, for instance, that if we're using as adults to cope with stress and anxiety and isolation, then maybe we need to find ways to healthy, healthy ways to deal with stress and anxiety and isolation so that we're not so stressed and anxious and isolated. Um, and also more money for treatment. So I think that we need much, much more treatment and research, but especially, you know, qualified helpers, because as, if there's no free lunch, there's kind of no free lunch for anybody. And there's a lot of people who are suffering, who most people who are suffering with addiction don't get any help. And I think if we could kind of bring it out into the light, here's the drugs, this is the consequences. If you find you're having too many of those consequences, you know, here's where you can come. Just like- And, and work on destigmatizing addiction. Yeah, I, I think it, that seems to be getting better. I, I, I could be living in a hole a little bit, but um, I think it's just so prevalent. It's hardly anybody who knows somebody who's not, got a problem. So, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a student today and her brother is in treatment. And I think, you know, I couldn't figure out why she wanted to have this long conversation. Finally, at the end of 45 minutes on a busy day, she said, well, my brother's in treatment. So I think, sadly, uh, the prevalence is making it less stigmatized because we recognize it could happen to us or our loved ones. And um, also, the other thing is that um, I think in the past, it was this idea that you were either dead or under a bridge or normal. And now uh, I think there's a vision that it's kind of a continuum. And there are many people who are uh, had problems with their drug use and now have full rich lives. So I think the more of that is evident than, you know, it'd be nice to me if, if people have more choices. And I think what I like about legalization is that we're um, in, you know, trusting people to choose, uh, which is, I think, always more effective in the long run than trying to legislate, uh -huh. you know, morality or good action. It doesn't seem to work so well. So when you, you were talking a, a little bit about um, just how many people need help and that there's not as much help available as there needs to be. Do you see, think that's something that, you know, the government needs to step in on, step into and create more opportunities or fund education for providers? Um, you know, what do you see as, as possible solutions to generating a pipeline of, of addiction, you know, researchers, treatment centers, because I know, you know, just we're here in San Antonio and for mental health services in general, unless you, you know, it's very hard to access resources. There just aren't enough providers. Mm -hmm. So yes, to, to all your uh, suggestions, I think um, we have a hard time getting access to healthcare, a lot of us do, and being able to afford it. And so I think that one of the things we know about recovery from addiction is it's a long-term process. It's not just that you go to detox and stop and then go back to your life and it'll work out. It, the relapses are extremely high. So it's very uh, lethal and it takes a lot of time to, and, and resources, I think, and support along that pathway, including often, you know, medical and other psychological support dealing with depression and anxiety or stress, um, lots of things. So we don't, we don't have the money for that really often. Most people don't have that. And I think, um, you know, I recognize there's a lot of needs in the world. You know, we need roads, we need good schools for kids. We need lots of things and it all costs money. So there's, you know, shouldn't, you know, there's, it's not like there's a pile somebody's holding somewhere. But I guess um, I especially don't think that the short-term detoxes are serving people well, because often they leave with a prescription that costs a lot of money. So we're subsidizing the drug company that makes it, but we're not subsidizing the kind of treatment that would, it's slow and tedious and maybe not quite as sexy, but it, does um, 
it would result in help. So I, I guess I think that on one side and then coming back to the kids, I guess I, I'll just be really brief about this, but I think that kids are hungry for interesting novel experiences. They're, they're hungry for trying new things and taking risks. And um, it's kind of the way they're built for good reason. Well, if you if we did a better job of providing healthy way outlets, you know, not every kid can go mountain biking or something, you know. And so we need ways for kids to explore the edges of their existence that don't involve addictive substances. And those could be service cores or, um, you know, philosophy camps or art or music, you know, these kinds of things where they can, uh, I guess, explore. And I think in, for a lot of young people, there's not much out there, you know, for them to explore, except that somebody has a bag of something and yeah. Uh, um, wow. And gosh, I hate to end this conversation, but we're almost at an hour. I just want to give you an opportunity, you know, first of all, thank you so much. There are a lot of wisdom, a lot of hard science, which we so appreciate. Um, but do you have any words of encouragement as we enter this holiday season with another surge on the way? Um, as we're thinking about, you know, the opportunities, we're all going to, we might be home again for a while. Um, what are your thoughts or encouragement on some mindful thoughts that we might have to head off more COVID drinking? Yeah, you know, <laughs> excessive it's, COVID drinking. It's really at the top of my mind because it's not as if I stopped drinking and then I never thought about it again. You know, since COVID, uh, it it's occurred to me. I, I'm sure if I were drinking, I would be very bad now because um, this is hard. So I've had to come up with these for myself, and I'll say it's hard. I uh, one of the things I do is be sure to connect. I have a few little circles of friends, mostly all online, but um, that. And the smaller they are, so the more intimate they are. Somehow intimacy, I think, is a good substitute for drugs. Um, maybe the, the best one. And just, just hearing about someone's life and sharing about my life is worth a lot. And I, and I would say, you know, we talk about social drinkers, but in my experience watching it and experiencing it, it's not really facilitating much social interaction. It's... <laughs> Actually, I think uh, relationships are maybe more deep and meaningful when they're sober and wide awake. Um, the other thing is getting outside in the woods and uh, doing something lovely for yourself, whatever that might be. Um, I guess the, the gist of what I'm saying is to really look at the benefits you're getting from the drug and just be sure that they're not, that they are more than the cost. And um, if not, it, there'd probably be a little dip where things aren't quite right, but I can assure you that there's uh, plenty of joy to be had without uh, gin and tonics or whatever it is, <laughs> chocolate, yeah. Thank you so much, You're welcome, Dr. Grissel. This has been a lovely time to spend together with you. Very encouraging. I like that you talked about intimacy and connection as a counterbalance or, or as the better, the higher way um, as we move through these next months of, of this thing that we're going through together and really just life. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody who joined us tonight. We will be sending out a link uh, that you can share with other people, as well as opportunities to support this kind of programming. Thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy your holidays. May they be healthy and intimate and full of connection. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.